Hey everyone, Path here. Now in this video, I want to talk about quantum numbers. These are numbers that can be used to describe parts of a quantum system that would otherwise need a lot more complicated wordy descriptions. And the great thing is that these quantum numbers, although they seem fairly simplistic compared to the mathematics of quantum mechanics, they actually come directly from the mathematics of quantum mechanics. Now, quantum numbers are basically used to describe certain quantities, certain things that we are allowed to know at the same time as knowing the energy of our quantum system. You may have heard of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which describes certain quantities that we are not allowed to know at the same time as each other. For example, the position and the momentum of a particle. We can't know these two perfectly well at the same time. Well, this doesn't apply to all quantities at once. For example, the version of the uncertainty principle we've just seen applies only to position and momentum, and the quantum numbers we'll be discussing today we are allowed to know at the same time as knowing the energy of our system. Now, to understand the meaning of everything I've said so far, let's understand how quantum numbers can be used to describe a very particular quantum system, electrons in an atom. If you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. Okay, so many of you might be familiar with the idea that an atom consists of a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons, and then electrons can be found around this nucleus at very specific distances away from the nucleus. These distances correspond to the energy that a particular electron has within an atom. The nearer the electron is to the nucleus, the lower its energy. And we refer to each one of these allowed positions for electrons as energy levels. But in this video, we'll also be calling them shells. Now, what if I were to tell you that if you know about this kind of model of the atom, then you're already familiar with one kind of quantum number. It's known as the principal quantum number, and it basically just describes which electron shell we're talking about. The shell nearest to the nucleus is labeled n is equal to one, the next one is n is equal to two, and then n is equal to three, and so on and so forth. As we've already said, n is equal to one is nearest to the nucleus, and it's also the lowest in energy. What this means is that when an electron is found in this shell, it has the lowest possible energy within that atom. The principal quantum number very easily allows us to define which electron shell we're talking about. More specifically, we can say that an electron, say found in the second shell, has a principal quantum number of two. And notice how much information we get just by saying what the principal quantum number is for a particular electron in an atom. We immediately know that the electron that we're looking at is in the second allowed energy level, which tells us something about the distance away from the nucleus of this particular electron and the energy of that electron. So that's a brief overview of our first quantum number. Next, let's take a look at what's known as the azimuthal quantum number. Some of you may be familiar with the idea that within an electron shell, we also have what are known as subshells. Now in quantum mechanics, electrons aren't technically always found at the distances given by this simple electron shell diagram. What these electron shells actually show us are the most likely distances of the electrons from the nucleus. But even if we focus on a particular energy level, say n is equal to one, the closest one to the nucleus, our electron could actually be found here or here or here. It's just most likely to be found here. This idea is represented in quantum mechanics by what is known as a wave function. More information on wave functions in this video up here. The wave function essentially shows us the likely places in which we will find our electrons in this case. And for the n is equal to one level, we've already seen that it could be found pretty much anywhere around the nucleus, most likely at this distance. Now the n is equal to one level is actually the simplest one to think about because it only has one subshell, the spherically shaped one that we've just looked at. To more clearly see what we mean by subshells, we actually need to take a look at the n is equal to two level. The n is equal to two level has two subshells. The first one again looks spherical, like the one that we've just seen for the n is equal to one level, which means that our electron could basically be found anywhere around the nucleus, but most likely at this distance here. Notice that the n is equal to two spherical subshell is not the same size as the previous one we saw for n is equal to one. This tells us that although our electron could be found at various different distances, the second energy level electrons are more likely to be found further away from the nucleus. So that's one subshell from the n is equal to two level. The other one is where it gets interesting. The other subshell looks like this. It's made up of three individual 
orbitals, each of which is shaped like a dumbbell, which is what is traditionally known as. Each of these dumbbells is perpendicular to each other, so we can imagine that one of them lies along our x-axis, one of them lies along our y-axis, and the third one lies along the z-axis. Each of these dumbbell-shaped orbitals can hold two electrons, but what does that actually mean? Well, if we focus on the x-orientated dumbbell, this means that the electrons found in this particular orbital can again be found you know, in different places, but are most likely to be found somewhere in the dumbbell shape. In other words, this orbital is no longer a spherically symmetric one. It's not that we'd find the electron at different distances away from the nucleus, but anywhere along the sphere is okay. It is actually directional now. We are most likely to find these electrons in this particular orbital along the x-axis and not necessarily much further away. And a similar sort of logic applies to the y and z orientated subshells as well. Now, we can clearly see that there's something different between the spherical subshell we talked about earlier and this triple dumbbell subshell that we've just looked at now. And we'll come to that difference in a moment, but it's important for me to reiterate here that the n is equal to one energy level only has one subshell, the spherical one. The n is equal to two energy level has two subshells, the spherical one and the triple dumbbell one. The n is equal to three energy level will have three different subshells. We won't go into their specific shapes, but it's important to note that the energy level dictates how many subshells there are for electrons to fill. And if we come back to the n is equal to two energy level and we look at all of the subshells, we find the most likely distance of an electron from the nucleus, then that's kind of what is described by the very simplified electron shell diagram from the very beginning. Okay, so now for the interesting question. What's the difference between the spherical subshell and the triple dumbbell shaped subshell other than the shape? And what happened to the azimuthal quantum number that we were supposed to be talking about? Well, the difference is that electrons within a particular subshell have different amounts of angular momentum. Angular momentum is a property that any object has if it's rotating or moving along a curved path, at least in classical physics. In quantum physics, it's a little bit more complicated, but the basic gist is the same. And it's worth noting here that we're not yet talking about the spin of individual particles. Spin is also a type of angular momentum, but spin is inherent to the particle itself. It doesn't need to be in an atom for it to have spin. It will have spin wherever it is. Whereas the kind of angular momentum we're discussing here, known as the orbital angular momentum, is only given to the electron if it's in a particular subshell. We can think of it as being specifically due to the positioning of the electron relative to where the nucleus is. And we can represent how much angular momentum an electron has in a particular subshell using the azimuthal quantum number L. Any electron in any one of the spherically shaped orbitals, known as the S orbitals, has no angular momentum at all. In other words, we give each s orbital the azimuthal quantum number L of zero. So for an electron in the lowest possible energy level, n is equal to one, it must be in the s subshell because in n is equal to one, there is only the s subshell, and therefore it has the azimuthal quantum number L is equal to zero. For an electron in the second shell and the s subshell, it will have the quantum numbers n is equal to two and L is equal to zero. But for an electron in the p subshell, it does have a certain amount of angular momentum. Specifically, it has one lot of h-bar of angular momentum. h-bar is just a constant known as the reduced Planck constant, but it's a very important quantity in quantum mechanics. And so electrons, when they have angular momentum, these will be in multiples of h-bar. Now, because in a p subshell, an electron has one times h-bar amount of angular momentum, we give it the azimuthal quantum number L is equal to one. If we were to look at the n is equal to three energy level, then we could have electrons in the s subshell with l is equal to zero, or the p subshell with l is equal to one, or what's known as the d subshell with l is equal to two. And so these are the three allowed subshells in the n is equal to three energy level. So at this point, we've talked about two quantum numbers that are very important for describing a particular electron in a particular atom. There are two more that we'll be talking about, and what we'll find out is that every single electron in a particular atom must have at least one different value in one of these quantum numbers. In other words, no two electrons can have exactly the same four quantum numbers describing it. The two quantum numbers we've looked at so far are the principal quantum number, n, and the azimuthal quantum number, l. The remaining two, ml and ms, look even more closely at the orbital angular momentum of a particular electron and the spin of the electron, respectively. 
But that is all discussion for a separate video. If you liked this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. If you've got any questions based on what we've talked about in this video, let me know in the comments down below. Also, please do check out my merch. It's a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. That'll be linked down in the description below, or you can find it on the store tab of my channel page. I also want to say a huge thank you to my Giga patrons and to all of my other patrons. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, there's a link to that in the description below as well. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you very soon.